Good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome. My name is Mona Cravens, and I serve as the Director of Student Publications here at USC. It was my privilege and joy to work with Darlene Hard for over 40 years. We're gathered here today to honor our dearly beloved Darlene. Some of you are related family members. Some have known Darlene from the world of tennis. And some are members of our own special Trojan family. Each of us had a very unique relationship with Dart. She nurtured each individual connection in a variety of ways. Above all, she admired and respected always a job well done. And as we know, she was born with incredible natural athletic ability. However, she worked diligently to perfect her tennis skills that placed her early on on the world stage. And no matter how high she climbed, she remained extremely humble about her career and her prowess as an international tennis star. A native Los Angelino, Darlene Ruth Hard, was born on January the 6th, 1936, at St. Vincent's Hospital, just up the street here in Los Angeles. She's the first of two daughters <clears throat> born to parents Ruth Dietrich Hard and Robert Kenneth Hard. A few years later, her only sister Claire came into the world, and we're pleased to have Claire and her daughter Sherry here with us today. And I'll pause just a minute as we have a couple of latecomers coming in. Darlene grew up in Montebello a working class suburb where her parents had met and played amateur tennis on the local city courts. She recounted early remembrances of hearing tennis balls bouncing off rackets as her mother often parked her stroller near the courts where her parents played. Her mother, Ruth, was a very strict disciplinarian of German descent. And as a result, early on, Darlene was taught the value and rewards of disciplined hard work. As a youngster, she was assigned several routine weekly household chores, along with an agreement that when she completed the chores, her reward would be bus fare and lunch money to travel on Saturdays across town to the renowned Los Angeles Tennis Club to watch the great players. So that's what she did on Saturdays when she got her chores done. Upon occasion, she would serve as one of the ball girls who ran to the net to retrieve the balls and throw them back to the players, and sometimes she would hit the ball back to them. The great players began to take note of Darlene's natural athletic ability, and one season when they were readying the LA Tennis Club's team of junior age members to travel back east to compete in the national junior level tournament, one of the parents said, let's get together and outfit that young Darlene hard to go with our team. She's a better player than all our children and we need to give her a chance. So they purchased a new tennis outfit and a racket and sent Darlene along with the team from Los Angeles Tennis Club. The rest is history. Darlene took the Eastern tour by storm. She won every match and returned to Southern California as the young junior level champion. She often gave credit to that experience as having launched her tennis career and was forever grateful to the members of the LA Tennis Club for recognizing her potential and encouraging her career early on. She continued playing all the local tournaments and eventually made her way to the national circuit. In between tournaments, she returned home long enough to pursue a degree in pediatric medicine at Pomona College. While there, she won the first women's intercollegiate national singles title. That was in 1958, and she was already ranked number two in the world. In her prime, Darlene ranked with the best in the sport. She traveled the world. She won big tournaments and shook hands with Queen Elizabeth, who handed her trophies. At one Wimbledon champion's dinner, she sat next to Prince Philip and chatted. That was so easy 
for someone so full of life and so at ease with her newfound notoriety. Following her 1973 induction to the International Tennis Hall of Fame, Darlene sat down with Bud Lesser, a film producer, for an interview. And those of us who know Darlene, she didn't do interviews very often, but she did at this point. So now we'll hear a few notable quotes and excerpts from their conversation. I think you'll enjoy it. This is a uh, very unique recording for the National Tennis Hall of Fame since it's being held outdoors. In the background, you can probably hear some uh, tennis balls being hit. And undoubtedly, you'll hear some cars pulling in and out of a nearby parking lot. Uh, many of the people are coming to take lessons from the great Darlene Hard, whose record is almost unparalleled in tennis. And I believe it really started so far as competition is concerned, in 1954 with uh, the winning of the girls' uh, doubles with Barbara Bright. Is that about right, Darlene? I think nationally it was true, yes. I had played in Southern California at the age of 13. Uh, tell us about uh, how you first took racket in the hand, even before 13. Well, I think my mother probably started me in the beginning. And she was a player to lose weight, quote unquote, after I was born. And she played a tennis, and she says her big claim to fame is that she took a set from Dorothy Bundy Cheney when she was number four in the United States. And uh, you only started when you were 13, or had you... No, no. I, my mother says I had a balsam racket when I was four, but I only enjoyed the game when I was 13. And uh, about that time, you had your first overseas trip? When I was 17, uh-huh, I went overseas. Uh, tell me about it. And the French competitions, I believe, were the first of your international uh, matches. Well, I think, first of all, I went to Jamaica and on the southern circuit in, into uh, Barranquilla, Colombia, and uh, Mexico, and we went that circuit. And while I was on that circuit, Bob Howe of Australia came to me, and he said, there's no reason why you shouldn't be on the international tour. And I said, well, I didn't even know that there was an international tour. And, and we knew of Wimbledon, but we did not know that... Um, you know, we w could play. I mean, we just were playing for fun of it. And so he said, well, call your mother from Jamaica and I'll sponsor you. And I said, well, you can't sponsor me. There's no, you know, there, there was no way. He said, you'll make enough money. You just trust me and I'll, I'll fill the bill if, if you don't. So I said, okay. So I called my mother and my mother is not the type of person to let me even sleep overnight at someone's house. But she said, okay, if I was chaperoned and if I was looked after and if I was going in a group and whatever, that she would let me go. So we went. What was uh, your reaction? I take it you were rather a, a young teenager for your years, uh, not a sophisticated one. No, I was very sophisticated, but my mother was very much of a German uh, authoritarian, and we just didn't, weren't allowed lots of freedom. But you so. did have dates and social activities. Oh, sure. Oh, sure, if oh. it didn't interfere with the tennis, yeah, sure. How was your French language? I cannot speak a word of French. How did you communicate, or shouldn't I ask? I think every language in every country they speak English, so there's there's no problem with communication. One of the French championships later on in my career, I dated a Russian boy, and Sergei Lekashev and I uh, I spoke no Russian. He spoke spoke no English. And we certainly communicated. <laughs> we didn't have any trouble at all. How about some of your subsequent partners uh, uh, in the French doubles now? Uh, I, I don't know uh, Mrs. Flights, but... Uh, Beverly Baker? Sure, you must know Beverly ah, Baker. The, that was Beverly all Baker. All four hands, yeah. And then uh, in 57, you won the du French doubles with Charlie Bloomer. She's English, I English, believe. English, yes. And 1960, uh, Marie Bueno. Bueno, uh-huh. How was it uh, like playing with her? She was a doubles champion of uh, many years. Well, we, I think, won 117 straight international matches before we were defeated. And that was against Margaret Court and Billie Jean and Casals and all of the big names, so. Playing. It's hard. I don't know. You know, everybody asks me today if, if the tennis today is as good as it was yesterday and, if, you know, what was it like when you came up? And I really don't know. Uh, I think we all play about the same, and I think we all give our hearts to it and I think we try very hard and it's hard to compare. I don't know how you would compare. But uh, you did play uh, with, for example, uh, uh, Maria and uh, then Althea mm -hmm. Gibson as a partner. 
And that yeah, bridged had, a lot of years. Oh, yeah. I've always had the best partners, that's for sure. <laughs> Rod Laver amongst the, the top of them. Oh, well, Rod must be uh, great to play with. He's terrific. And terrific fellow. He carried my luggage for me on tour, so I, I thought he was terrific. I wondered how he developed that huge arm. That's what, uh, carrying my luggage. His, his right arm went in the, with his luggage. <laughs> Tell me, about, tell me about Darlene Hard's game. Uh, were you a backcourt uh, ground no. stroker? Or? No, I was not noted for my ground strokes. I was, I was <laughs> thank goodness I had a servant of all, like, or I wouldn't have had much of a game. <laughs> well, I have an acre, and I have two monkeys, and a horse, and um, three dogs, and five cats, and two rabbits. And so, yes, I am busy. Are they subject to tennis-type discipline? Very much so. Very much so. Uh, are these just for your own amusement, or do you run them to the studios? Or No, it's all for my own amusement. I think my interest in monkeys came from the fact that when I was in Brazil, Maria had a monkey. And I always said, oh, gee, I wish I had one, too. So when I came home, I finally got a, an opportunity to own one. And so now I have two. <laughs> You haven't taught them to play tennis. No, no. Just living with them is enough. <laughs> Very much so, yes. I think the, the interest in spectating, for instance. Uh, Americans seem to be participants, but we don't seem to be very good spectators. And I think when you get over to Europe, and particularly in England, when you see people queue overnight uh, to get a ticket to Wimbledon, uh, it's it's awe-stricken. I, I just, it's amazing. I... We'll never forget being picked up by a limousine and, and taken to the place. I think that um, it's an experience in its own. You know, having an audience with a pope, um, talking to the Duke of Kent, uh, talking to the Duchess, talking to the Queen. Uh, these are just fantastic experiences. You were presented at court? Yes. Not at court, on the court. On the tennis court. <laughs> on the tennis court, yes. So you didn't have to learn all the protocol of... Uh... Well, I got caught up in that a little bit, too. I think with Althea and I, in the final one year, she was down on the court, and uh, we were told how to approach her, but we were never given directions on how to get away. And so we approached her properly, and we curtsied, and we did all the proper things, and we had our little tete -tete with her, and she was beautiful. And uh, she dispatched us, and, and quickly we looked at each other as if, well, now, do we turn? Do we back up? We had this long car red carpet on which to walk, and we didn't know how we were supposed to get away. So she, um, Althea started backing up very slowly. Well, evidently, I didn't back up slowly. I was so excited that I did a jig going backwards. So they, <laughs> they in big headlines, had this going on. So it happens. What were your feelings when you were on center court at Wimbledon for the first time? <laughs> I don't think you have any feelings. I think you're so numb, you're so excited that you just you really are not aware that, um, that you're where you are. And I think that um, my first shock was when I came off the court and found myself playing on the television because they had rerun my match. And I knew that the opponent was the right opponent, and I knew that the score was going the way the score should have gone. But that chunky little chub out there was not doing what I thought Darlene Hart should have been doing. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the chunky little chub. Uh, uh, you do not have a long reach. You are not tall. Uh, was this no. a stumbling block uh, to you in playing competitive tennis? I don't tennis? think so, no. I think, you know, another story on that is Ted Schroeder sells refrigeration. And Ted came into, when I was working as a waitress, he came into the restaurant and told my employer that, that this junior that was out there in the front serving the food would be a good tennis player if she would just lose weight. So he left, and I didn't even know that he had sold refrigeration to my employer. My employer came up, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Darlene, I've got the inside on your tennis game. And I said, oh, do you really? And he said, yes, I do. He said, Ted Schroeder has just been in here, and he has watched you play, and he has decided that you really will be a champion. And I said, oh, that's so exciting. That's just really great. He said, but you have to lose weight. And I said, well, that's impossible. You know, I've, I've been the, my same chunky little self all my life, so I, that's impossible. Well, later in the year, I went on tour. And when I came back, Lou Hode was my partner. And we were playing the Pacific Southwest, and lo and behold, who did we play in the first round but Mary Prentice, Mary Arnold Prentice, and Ted Schroeder. 
and we played the match, and I, I don't recall the scores. It, it's unimportant. And after we shook, we went up to net. We shook hands, and I, Mary Arnold was a friend of mine for years, and I shook hands, and she said, "Nicely played, hun." I said, "Thank you." And I looked over at Ted, and he wouldn't shake hands with me. He took his right arm and he threw it around my waist, and he said, "Don't lose an ounce, hun." <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think the weight or the height or the whatever is a, is a, an asset or a deficit either way. I think that you learn to compensate. In our day, we played for country, we played for the flag, we played because we loved the game. I love teaching, and I, and I, have, I have a responsibility. I came up in a public park, and I am teaching in the public park I grew up in. And so I have a great responsibility to give back a lot of knowledge that was gained throughout the world. Isn't that wonderful in her own words? In 1960, Darlene won the national hard court title with Billie Jean King, and also the deciding match of the inaugural 1963 Federation Cup over Australia with King as her partner. She was amazing, one of my heroes, said King, who is eight years younger than Darlene. She was a great doubles player, had quick hands, and was a great athlete. I was 13 years old when she asked me to play the national hard courts with her. We won, but I was so afraid I was going to let her down. Recently, Billie Jean was in Paris attending the French Open. I think it was the 50th anniversary of her first win of the French Open. And she was being honored by the French government with a prestigious Legion of Honor award. She graciously found time to record a fitting tribute in honor of Darlene to be played here today, Billie Jean. Darlene Hard was a very important part of my life, particularly in my younger years. We first practiced together when I was 13 and I knew she was a big deal then. She was a champion's champion, winning 21 major singles, doubles, and mixed doubles titles. We were teammates on the U.S. team at the inaugural Federation Cup competition in 1963 in London, where she was our very best player. The Federation Cup is the Women's World Cup of Tennis. We were down match points in the deciding match and came back to win, helping the USA become the first Federation Cup champion. Darlene was my friend, full of life and laughter, smart and considerate, and one of the greatest champions on and off the court. We miss her. We also have a bit of footage that Darlene played, uh, of Darlene playing Althea Gibson in the 1957 uh, singles finals at, at, at Wimbledon and her interview following the championship match. And again, it's Darlene all the way. So we'll play that, Scott, please. And here's Darlene Hard receiving service in the first game. She's seeded number, fifth, number five this year. And of course she beat the former champion, Louise Gruff. She plays the typical American game, hard hitting and trying to get up to the net. Well, it's another real scorcher here. I've just been told that the shade temperature is 89, which means it's well over 100 on the court. And now Miss Gibson, four love and 30 all. up to the net, but the volley didn't go where 30, it was meant to. 40. Actually, Miss Gibson today is doing more placing than real power stuff. Not getting very many of her first services in yet. Backhand gives Miss Hard her first game, 4-1. Game to Miss Hard. Miss Gibson leads by... It's about the third time that's happened. <laughs> Hard managed to get that, but only at the second or third attempt. She looks... Dean Hall.
That's Miss Hard's best shot, that chop drag down backhand return of service, which catches Miss Gibson with the ball at her feet. 15.30. to the net, Molly, good rally that one, what an athletic girl Miss Gibson is, she turned like a cat there, you. oh she's volleyed out, Advantage Miss Hard. Oh. <laughs> ah, it's a lovely volley there. You. Page, Miss Gibson. Point for 5-1 to Miss Gibson. Oh, wonderful smash. Right to the line, and that makes it 5-1 to Althea Gibson in the second set, having won the first. And now here comes Her Majesty the Queen to present the prize to the winner and to the runner-up. They've laid out green carpet on the green court. She goes towards the table covered by the Union Jack with the famous trophy perched on it. <laughs> Two girls trying to synchronize their curtsies. The real centre court acclamation for both the winner and the loser. Great moment for these two American girls. As Her Majesty returns to the royal box in their lenses. And at last, they're allowed to leave. Althea, the Gibson girl of 1957, and her defeated opponent, but still smiling, gay little Darlene Hard. Congratulations to both of them. And here is the lady who lost today, and may I say, but I thought you lost with great gallantry, Darlene. Thank you very much. It wasn't a matter of gallantry. It was just a matter that I lost because I was beaten. <laughs> yes, but you took it awfully well. I thought that little bit of applause you gave in, in the last game when she made a particularly good shot was very, very sporting. Well, it isn't a matter of being sporting, really, because, I mean, Althea, and as you know, in the first point of the match, I got a bad call, and she double faulted. So I, I must say that Althea is very sporting also. Well, that's... It, at least the match was played in, in a very fine tradition of sportswomanship. I didn't think, quite honestly, that you were at your best, but of course you were up against a very fine player. I certainly was, yes. But didn't you feel that um, you had played better in some of your earlier rounds? Well, yes, but then again, you see, I had... Uh, my opponents were playing a bit worse. Yes. You see, which makes me shine a little bit more. And once you start winning, you more or less gain confidence and you keep going. 
difficult. Yeah. My opponent today did not let me get started, let alone stay going. <laughs> I kept going under. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, did the heat affect you? It certainly affected everybody else. Yes, I think we both were affected by it. It was very, very hot out there. And um, uh, you've played her before, of course, and you did win a set from her at Beckenham, didn't yes, you? Yes, three weeks ago. Well. <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid that I depended on her play in Beckenham, and she played maybe 200% better than she played me at Beckenham. So as a result, I got 200% less games. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we do hope you'll be coming back again next year. I certainly hope so also. Because... Um, you're very, very young. You're only 21, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. That's nasty. Women aren't supposed to tell their age. Ah, well, I think you're allowed to when you're 21, because apart from little Mo, you must be about the youngest finalist all for a quarter of a century or more. Oh, that sounds like... Oh, that's nice. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we I shall... have to come back. Yes, well, we'll be very glad to see you, and we hope to go even one stage further and win it next time. I will keep my fingers crossed also. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, darling. Darling, Sister Claire recently s discovered several tapes that we were able to convert into viewable content. And one is footage of a training film that Darling made several years ago as well. Well, quite a few years ago. In it, she demonstrates various tennis skills and strokes, and we'll watch a couple of clips from that. In 1977, my husband Terry and I were living near Griffith Park here in Los Angeles and we decided to take some tennis lessons. So we signed up for a series from the local pro at the Vermont Canyon Courts. One day when I was having my racket restrung, I noticed a small three by five card near the cash register that just read simply, US champion 1960-1961. I asked the assistant, I said, what does that mean? She said, oh, that's your teacher, Darlene. I said nothing to Dar, but I came down here to USC, and of course we had no internet in those days, so I went over to Doheny Library and looked in the encyclopedias where I found page after page of multiple listings of Darlene's extraordinary tennis career. US Open champion, French Open, Wimbledon doubles, Whiteman Cup, Pan American Games, and the list goes on and on. A few days later, I said to her at a lesson, Darlene, I did not know you are a famous tennis player. Her reply, so typical, oh moans, that was a lifetime ago. We continued lessons for a year or two and through several conversations, I became aware that Dard was nearing the end of her tennis teaching career it seemed she'd be pleased to graciously retreat from the tennis courts to embark on a career here at USC. So in 1981, she began working in USC student publications. She processed financial transactions. She maintained our daily computer system updates. She designed yearbook pages, and she wrote feature pieces. She soon made very good friends with one of our colleagues in student affairs and Lynette Merriman is here today for some thoughts about Darlene. Thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of knowing the post-tennis Darlene. 
uh, for over 20 years. And I had the privilege of being able to call her my dear friend for nearly 20 years. Uh, like many, I met Darlene through Mona. And when we first met, there were probably just a few words exchanged to one another, with one another. But over time, I realized that we both got to work at about the same time every day, which was very early in the morning. And that was usually the time when the only folks on campus were the groundskeepers, the squirrels, and Darlene. And so when you are one of two people who are on campus at that time, and you are both parking your car in the same structure and walking to the same office building every morning, well, we basically then started to have conversation. I think I was the first person to say good morning to her. And in the beginning, there wasn't a lot of conversation between us. It usually was a sentence or two. It might be about the weather or the day. But over time, there were more sentences, there were conversations, and then soon there were very thoughtful conversations every morning. And for me, I earned so much um, respect for Darlene Hard. Darlene was a hard worker. She cared a lot about this university. She cared a lot about the students here and a tremendous amount about the staff that she worked with. I remember one time she shared that a student she either know, knew or a student that she had learned about um, had been recently identified as someone receiving a Swim With Mike scholarship, which is a scholarship for physically challenged athletes. I had never seen so much enthusiasm and happiness and energy as she shared that there was a student who was a recipient that she had some connection with. On occasion, if there was a change at the university, and this is USC, so there's never any change, um, occasionally there was a change she would disagree with. And when she did, she spoke more. And she spoke with passion. And Darlene did have a lot to say. Um, her thoughts were very meaningful. They had purpose. But unfortunately, seldom the thoughts were shared. But when they were, they were very, very special. And I learned a tremendous amount when she shared these thoughts with me. At some point along our friendship, I did learn about her tennis background. And she never brought it up, so I would bring it up every so often, just a handful of times. And when she spoke with humility, the message was always the same. She played for the love of the game, and when she played, the love of the game was the only thing that mattered to her. So the Darlene I knew was quiet and observant. She was quiet and caring. She was quiet and thoughtful. She was quiet and insightful. She was quiet and dedicated and quiet and oh so humble. To me, Darlene was like the treasure beneath the sand. And so now it's really hard for me to walk every morning across campus. It's quiet again. It's the quiet that Darlene would like. And I treasured those times. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Another colleague and a current member of our staff, Scott Smith, first became acquainted with Darling during his undergraduate experience and serving as the Daily Trojan Editor-in-Chief. Scott will now share some of his impressions and thoughts of Darlene. It 
It was my pleasure to know Darlene uh, as both a student and a colleague uh, in the Office of Student Publications here at USC. She truly was a fixture on the fourth floor of, student, of the Student Union building, an integral part of student publications and a steadfast presence. And despite her international fame and the critical nature of her contributions to the production of the Daily Trojan newspaper and El Rodeo yearbook, she always remained a quiet, unassuming presence. I can remember watching Darlene's annual efforts to adjust each face in the graduate section of the yearbook until it was lined up just right with all of the others. And I even remember back to the days we saw in that photo earlier uh, where she sliced and waxed and carefully laid out the advertisements in the Daily Trojan with a similar focus and pride of work. One of my fondest memories of Darlene, though, isn't of her work on the fourth floor. In the springtime of each year, just before commencement, when yearbook season arrived on campus, Darlene would sit on Han Plaza in slightly different locations over the years. I remember her near the open end of the freight truck or under a tent by the pharmacy or just in front of the kiosk in the middle of the parkway always behind a table stacked high with yearbooks in careful rows. Whatever it was, wherever it was, that was Darlene's domain. Giving out yearbooks to students was something she didn't just enjoy. She took pride in it. She would always ensure that it was done just right. She enjoyed seeing the students and sharing the book with them that she had worked so hard on often connecting with athletes and smiling as graduates and their families took part in that time-honored tradition. The parts I remember most fondly, however, were the quiet downtimes in the slower third week of yearbook distribution. As the spring weather touched the oasis of the University Park campus and the plaza began to bustle with pre-commencement activity. With fewer students needing to pick up books by that week, there were plenty of chances for Darlene to sit and take it all in. And sometimes I was lucky enough to sit with her for a while. She would watch it all, keeping note of what was happening in our little corner of the world as commencement day drew nearer. Chairs being unfolded into rows in Alumni Park, families taking pictures by Tommy Trojan, but mostly the dogs. It was like someone biting into a pastry only to discover that the filling was the most delicious that they had ever tasted. When a student or staff member would walk by with a dog, Darlene's face would light up with delight and an instant easy empathy for that four-legged friend. Even better would be the times the dog and owner would come up to the table for a visit. That's the part that I think of so often and fondly, the sparkle in Darlene's eyes, the unique way her voice would just come alive with delight and unrestrained love. The way Darlene would instantly connect with an animal friend was truly magical. She would positively beam, and that energy was felt not just by the dog, but by everyone around. You hear cliches, about someone's smile lighting up a room, but Darlene's connection with animals was on another level entirely. The way her eyes would dance and the unabashed warmth that she shared. No animal was ever a stranger to Darlene. Everyone was like a long lost friend that she had just been hoping to hug. The world around didn't matter so much when there was a furry friend to visit with. And while there are so many qualities I appreciated about Darlene and memories that I return to, it's those moments of magical connection, that gleam in her eyes, that's what I carry closest to my heart.
As Scott said, Darlene loves small children and animals. If you were ever walking with her and there's an animal anywhere close by, including a perfect stranger, simply walking their pet, Darlene would bend over, reach out her hand, and start talking directly to the animal, who warmed up to her immediately. Owners were flabbergasted and pleased that she could relate so naturally to their pets. Over the years, she adopted many rescue pets. Among her animal kingdom were her champion jumper horses, the Pied Piper, Peter for short, and June Moon, nicknamed Junie. She had Ruffian, the raccoon, Mandy, a spider monkey, Muffy, Friska, and Morris cats. She collected turtles, rabbits, and made a home for a pet goat named Easter Lily. And we at USC knew her favorite little Maltese puppies, naturally named Helen and Troy. And as of late, she took in Mr. Hercules, Miss Piggy, Rosie, and her favorite, who still remains with us, and her sister, little Ginger. Darlene's work ethic here at USC past the 40, over the past 40 years was one of total commitment to a teamwork effort. She always exhibited the same drive and determination that earlier had taken her to the top of the tennis world. Every morning she would arrive early to begin routine daily duties, duties as Lynette has described. Once those were finished, she'd come in and she'd say, now Mons, what's up? what else is on our agenda today? I have one really very amusing incident I'd like to tell you about. In 1983, when Walter Mondale was running for political office, he came to USC on the campaign tour. And his advanced team began coming to our office to place ads in the Daily Trojan for his upcoming appearance. But his team kept putting off paying us for the ads, saying they would pay when the candidate arrived in town. Well, that day came and went and still no payment. We found out that the campaign team was staying in a Beverly Hills hotel. We managed to get the address. Darlene drove over there, marched into the lobby of the hotel, and demanded the payment for the ads that we had run. She said if the guy didn't come down from upstairs, she was going to call the cops. Well, that's the last thing that a political campaign wanted, right? She refused to leave the lobby until finally the campaign manager did stagger down the stairs and threw some money toward Darlene. She soon arrived back in her office, grinning from ear to ear, holding a fistful of what were vouchers, probably the guy's expense money. That's all he had to give us. So I said, Darlene, what did you do? She said they didn't know who they were up against. <laughs> Abundance of determination. We produced the Daily Trojan newspaper in El Rodeo with her help without ever missing a deadline. But in addition to our assigned duties, we painted the hallways and offices. We repositioned equipment and furniture and tackled other pressing needs. Darling never said no, regardless of the nature of the job. She was dependable cheerful and enthusiastic, and took great pride in our collective accomplishments. Recently, Bill Dwyer, the internationally acclaimed sports editor of the Los Angeles Times, wrote a piece that encapsulated Darlene perfectly. Darlene Hard the most underpublicized, underappreciated, possibly underrated tennis player of the last century. For four or five years in the late 1950s and early 60s, there was no doubt that Darlene was the best women's tennis player in the world. In closing, I'd like to read an excerpt from an essay that apparently resonated with her very early on in her tennis career. Quote, I am immersed in a sea of calmness. I align myself with its flow of quiet strength. The calmness sustains me. Because I desire to do well, 
I am filled with expectancy. I am thankful that I do not have to do this alone, but that there is one who is with me at all times to help me when I turn to him. Ask that your joy may be complete. Ask and you shall receive." End of quote. I am grateful that our paths crossed so many years ago. Becoming best of friends with Darlene enriched my life beyond words. We will always love you, Dar. She rests eternally in the Rose Hill Cemetery in Whittier, underneath a very fitting gravestone inscription, Darlene Hart, forever a champion. Thanks to all of you for being here today and also to those who have attended virtually. Please note on the back of your program information on our recently established scholarship fund in Darlene's name through the USC Skull and Dagger Society. Our celebration of life for Darlene will conclude with a brief musical tribute, the beautiful equality for four trombones composed by Beethoven in 1812 and played for his own service a few years later in 1827. Thank you again for coming to honor our beloved, the one, the only, Darlene Ruth Hart.
Thank you again, everyone. Please visit and enjoy your refreshments, and thanks for being here today.